I realize that um, we're only going to do another hour, and um, I'm probably not going to get into the 50 Miracles Principles much today. Um, well, we'll get into it. I'm not going to neglect it, uh, but we'll do that in June, July, and, and August. And um, I do want to get into talking a little bit after this about uh, what a miracle is. Okay, so that we're talking about miracles, so let's talk about that. All right. So, uh, are you okay? okay. Rolling. Rolling. Uh, so let's go on. So at one point, Jesus went into a lengthy discussion about Freud uh, that was clearly unrelated to the basic teachings of the course. I think this is in part because uh, Helen and Bill were Freudians, and they just wanted to understand the connection and the relationship that was going on there. It was not part of the teachings of the course. Uh, they was very, very clear that this had not related. It's in the Yurt text. It's in Robert's section. It's interesting, but um, Young does not come off well in uh, Helen's original script. Uh, this was uh, neither Bill nor uh, Helen liked Young, and I might say that this was the first place at which I came into a little uh, difference uh, between Bill and Helen and myself. However, we never talked about this. I deliberately avoided the subject because um, at the time, my doctoral supervisor, uh, Dr. John Johnson Jr., was a Jungian analyst here in New York City. I was working with a Jungian analyst here in New York City, a well-known woman analyst. Uh, I really enjoyed Young. I was teaching course. I started teaching classes on Young, actually at the New School University here. And I taught a course in the, the fall of '72 that was called Young Tayard in the Future of Consciousness. Uh, my uh, department head liked it. He said that was a, thought that was an interesting combination to have a whole class on. So I was really immersed in, and I taught a course on alchemy. Uh, at both at the New York University and for the American ARE, the Association of Research and Enlightenment here in New York City. They did a whole day seminar on that. And so I thought that, you know, obviously Jung was into a spiritual dimension, the collective unconscious and all that, that Freud had missed out on. But there, there I guess there were other reasons why uh, Bill and Helen didn't care for Jung. So we just left the topic alone, okay? Um, so that's what I said there. So back here, so from chapter 16 on, there are increasing number of passages in verse, and the last two chapters of the course are all in iambic pentameter. Uh, so we got a, a five beat rhyme that's going throughout that part. And from lesson 99 on, the entire workbook, is in blank verse. That's uh, unrhymed uh, poetry, of course. And um, nothing was changed in the entire workbook. So by the time we get around to the workbook, there's no reason to change anything because uh, Helen's clear at this point. And from then on, I mean, with everything else, the psychotherapy pamphlet is clear, the manual for teachers is clear, the song of prayer, which is one of those beautiful things that she wrote, well, sometime we'll We'll talk about that. It was also the last thing that she took. That was in 1977. So Bill's original typing, that's the big book here. This is the Ur text, as we've said. And uh, when this was found, people got really excited about it and thought that we'd been deceived. Uh, there was no deception really going on. It just wasn't supposed to be part of it. Um, did I hit this button again? 
Okay. Uh, at times, Helen did not read everything to Bill that was in her notebook because she said she knew it did not belong in the course. Okay? Now, despite that fact, that now appears in here because it's in the notebook, right? So there's this unnecessary uh, problem here. At other times, she dictated things to Bill that she got on the spur of the moment. So it was like, if you're a writer, if you're an author, you know, you go back, you edit, you start rewriting what, you're, what, what you've been sort of working on before, and you'll get an, another idea. You'll get another impulse to add something in here that seems to make sense. It just would be a perfectly natural thing to do. So uh, Jesus is sort of adding on a little bit more, and so that got in there. And Helen was always uh, in communication. This is from Ken now. Helen was always in communication with Jesus. She retyped the Ur text twice, uh, and doing further editing per Jesus' instruction as she wanted. That was leading up, that was going from this to the Edgar Casey edition, right? Um, and again, there's, there's editing that going on. This is natural. You would expect that to be happening. Uh, Helen never made any editorial decisions on her own. She was very clear, and this is something she was very clear. This was Jesus' book. It was not her book. She was just the scribe. That's all there was. At one point, Helen wrote down, miracles are cobwebs of steel. And Jesus so he said flatly, says, that's not what I said. I mean, this we want to just clarify this, right? I mean, what would cobwebs of steel be anyhow? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it hardly fits really the definition of what a miracle is. As we, we will get to the definition of a miracle today. It sounds like a description of this world. It does. You know, you know, yeah. Look at Manhattan, right? <laughs> I'm amazed by the con incredible building that's going on around you know, with all these cobwebs of steel that we see around us. So when the course first came through, it came through chap without chapter heads or section breaks. And Helen, again, in consultation with Jesus, uh, supplied some of these breaks and, and section heads. And Ken did help out some in this simply by um, suggesting that a break was necessary here. He would read through some of the material, et cetera, but it wasn't like he was do doing the writing himself. But naturally, the first book that Ken read in 1973 was the Hugh Lynn edition of The Course in Miracles, right? As he did that, he realized that especially in the first four chapters, there were some really very muddy parts that needed greater clarification. In fact, it's, <laughs> at one point, uh, there was so many mud and so much change that had to be done that <laughs> Ken said to Helen, look, why don't you just ask Jesus to re the first four chapters? <laughs> Hell, no way. <laughs> there was no way that she was going to re have that re-dictated. And that wasn't what Jesus wanted either. So Jesus says that some of the words, uh, like the phrase Son of God, Atonement, are always in caps. And the fact is, when you read through the Ur text edition, you'll find that a lot of the words are in caps, uh, just in the middle of the, in the sentence, which does kind of give it sort of an interesting emphasis. Uh, some of those, a lot of those were dropped. In other cases, they'll be in quotation marks or in italics within the context of the, of the course. So most of the textual changes, as we said, were occurred in the first four chapters. It's been suggested Ken was involved in this. I already mentioned that he did make some suggestions, but uh, the last line here, the changes were all made by Helen in consultation with Jesus. I think that is really the main emphasis that I'm making today. That's the, that's the, the story. At some point, under the uh, false pretenses, I, I think I told the, the urtext, this was also stolen from the Library of Congress. And Ken thought at the time that what a safer place could he put this than in the Library of Congress. Nevertheless, it was stolen from the library. Now, we don't know who did this. Uh, and um, 
while uh, the Library of Congress was embarrassed by the fact that this has happened, uh, they didn't get particularly upset about it because after all, here we got this religious document that's stolen. I mean, you know, what's the big deal? You know, it's not like uh, something from the CIA <laughs> or what we see on the news today, right? Uh, so you can buy this on Amazon.com, and I think it's also available on, uh, on the Internet. You can download it. Again, it doesn't matter which copy of the course you read. And as I said, I much prefer the inner piece of, uh, Foundation of Inner Pieces edition because I think that's the one that Jesus clearly intended that we do read. Uh, it's the clearest. It's fun to read some of these other things. <coughs> Uh, it's particularly from a scholastic point of view, and I am sure that scholars for well into the future, uh, as this becomes more well-known and accepted, I might add that it's really interesting to me that uh, it has not been accepted. Uh, <laughs> I had this, by traditional Christianity, well, uh, I had this really naive, I was working as a Methodist minister at the time, uh, I got the course, and I spent 16 years uh, trying to bring the course into the church. I thought it was just going to be a matter of time before the ministers came along, saw what I saw, and said, well, yes, this is the real deal, so why don't we, uh, why don't we preach this? I mean, there are so many concepts within the context of traditional Christianity that I never understood, uh, particularly Jesus suffering, dying, and bleeding for my sins, the whole the idea of what atonement is in traditional Christianity and what it is in terms of the course are so, in, in traditional Christianity, as you know, uh, it means accepting the fact that Jesus suffered and died and bled for your sins. How that became traditional Christianity, we'll, we'll not, I'm not going to go there, <laughs> just because I don't even know how it became it, but it, it's just sort of a strange idea, the, the whole idea of and what the way communions are now, I mean, you, you, you go to church on Sunday. If you're in the tradi Catholic tradition, you're drinking the blood of Jesus. You're eating the body of Jesus. There, there's a line in the Course where it says, Jesus says, I don't want to share my body with you. I want to share my mind with you. You know, I want you to think like I think. You know, see the way I see. This is not about something with physical. I think the... The problem is that the ego is such a physical thing. You know, it's the body is the ego's chosen home. So we tend to think of everything in relationship to the material world, the outside world. Again, that's what an emphasis is to go. There's nothing outside of you. And yet the, the outside becomes fascinating to us. We're very plugged into what's going on on the outside. You'll never find God. That's not to say that... You know, you can't appreciate nature or music or some of the wonderful ways in which uh, we can find deeper spiritual dimensions, but still, it's all in the mind. So, I said we would talk about what a miracle is. So, let's, maybe we'll actually get into a few of the miracles principles today. I thought it would be, before we start talking about the principles, though, let's talk about what is a miracle. So, uh, a miracle is not some sort of phantasmagorical change in the physical world. Uh, it has nothing to do with raising people from the dead or parting of the Red Sea. Uh, it's a change in mind about the world rather than a changing of the world. That is such an important point. Everything is dependent upon how we see. And the more I study this, the more I realize this is about everything you see, but this is particularly true in terms of other people and your relationship with other people and the deep need we all have to understand that we're all already saved, actually, that everyone, no matter how dark the soul may appear to be, uh, the light of God is still in there, and our challenge is to look for the light. Uh, even though there's a lot of darkness that's going on, a lot of sadness that's going on in terms of the outside, right? People do terrible things. They kill each other. Sometimes they engage in mass murders. And, you know, we see more 
of that, but it doesn't make any difference. It still depends on how you see. Let's go on. So a miracle is a correction in perception. It's a very important point because our perception is misdirected. It's misdirected primarily because of our judgmental mind. We want to find problems in the world. We love to find problems in the world. We spend a great deal of time talking about all the problems that are out there in the world. Keep in mind, again, the phrase, there's nothing outside of you. So if you are seeing the problem, the problem is in you. Even when there's a real problem, by that I mean, that doesn't mean that our response shouldn't be a loving response. Obviously, with some folks, we have to stop them from misbehaving or acting out. We don't know how to fix them or to help them, so we have to lock them up, literally, to keep them from hurting other people or themselves primarily. But that doesn't mean that our response still is not to, not to be a, a loving response, right? I like to remember the movie uh, Dead Man Walking with uh, Susan Sarandon playing Sister Pridgen, who has this uh, murderer that she's working with, and uh, she doesn't deny what he's done, but at the same time, she loves him, right? And thank God you got somebody, had an interesting sort of little experience recently. Uh, someone wrote to me, said they were uh, thinking about suicide, uh, feeling very depressed, uh, not even understanding why that they felt depressed. Uh, I think a good part of that has to do with what might be called existential angst. Uh, by that I mean just the whole wrongness of <laughs> being trapped in a in an ego, and being trapped in a body, being trapped in time, and not being able to to see a way out. I mean, just uh, actually, Heather and I were talking before class started about how these bodies are heavy, life is heavy. You got to you got to take care of all these responsibilities. And there, there are times that every one of us are going to say, "Stop the world! I want to get out. I want I want off." You know, that especially if there's like it seems like there's too much insanity going on inside you and or in the world, either one, right? How do you maintain your peace of mind when the world is crazy? How do you maintain your peace of mind when your own health is producing an issue or your money gut problems or whatever the issues are that or your relationship issues are the main thing, right? So, let me come back to that. A miracle is a correction perception from the ego's world of sin, guilt, and fear to the Holy Spirit's world of forgiveness. Now, it really is always forgiveness. So the Course is all about forgiveness. It's the, the symbol that Ken Wapnick used for his foundation for A Course in Miracles was a stylized use of the word forgiveness with a star, right? It's all about forgiveness because all that forgiveness is, is just simply letting go. It's so simple. It's just letting the world be what it is, letting somebody else be who they are, letting circumstances be what they are without thinking you've got to fix it or straighten it out or get upset about it. The fact that you get up, whenever you get upset about anything, <laughs> it's always a really good idea to take a really deep look inside and say, why? Why is this, why is, uh, what's going on in Washington upsetting me if that's what's going on, right? Or why is somebody else's behavior upsetting me if that's what's going on? It doesn't really make any difference, right? It's not you, right? So a miracle reverses projection by restoring it to the mind, its causal function, allowing us to choose again. So. Stavrov, that's what we were talking about at the break, right? About the causal function, right? So it reverses projection. So let's keep in mind that these minds of ours are very projective. So we are constantly making up the world. We're constantly analyzing. We're constantly, we're const everything. Everything the eyes fall upon. All of the thoughts. We're 
good it and bad it and pretty it and ugly it and define it and analyze it. And the course is really to have a mystical experience. Uh, really what's called for is to stop all that. I mean to completely stop the mind. You want peace of mind. The, this this is foundation is set up to publish the course is the foundation for inner peace. Right? Because that's what we want. Well, how do you get to peace of mind? You cannot have peace of mind and be projective at the same time. Another way to say that is you cannot be receptive and projective at the same time. So the Course is just asking us to be to receptive, to let things be what they are. Let other people be who they are. Seek not to make of love an enemy. But the ego is relishes enemies. It, it, it thrives on enemies. It looks for enemies. It, which also means that it's not happy. Uh, it's, it can't p possibly be in a happy frame of mind and be looking for problems at the same time. How are you going to look for problems and just be contented? Uh, but well, of course, it's just about being contented. It's just about letting, just getting quiet, for one thing. It's interesting, animals. Think about the animals. Every animal knows how to be quiet. Think about that. Every animal knows how to just dogs, cats, birds, they can just shut down the mind. I mean, they can just be. They can just be hanging out on a branch or laying in front of a fireplace or sleeping or, or you know, whatever your cat does or your dog does or whatever. But it, it's very difficult for human beings to be able to quiet their minds <laughs> down to the point where it's just quiet. But again, the Course said you've got to get quiet to become receptive. Because you can't be projective at the same time. So um, it reverses this process. So that if, if we're projecting, then that's going out. So reversing the process means that we're, we're going in rather than out. Right? Understanding that all there is is the mind. We are learning how to choose in line with the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. This is from the Course. It says, Christ's vision is a miracle. It comes from far beyond itself, for it reflects eternal love and the rebirth of love, which never dies. See, it never dies. It reflects it, but has been kept obscure. See, the good news is that it's always there. <laughs> it's just that we obscure it. We, we, we keep from seeing it. Christ's vision pictures heaven, for it sees a world so like to heaven that what God created perfect can be mirrored there. And that's why it, it, it is perfect, by the way. <clears throat> that's why I said in my book over there, which is called Lesson One on Perfect Happiness, has not done as well as the other books because I think people don't believe that there's such a thing as per perfect happiness, <laughs> that you could really have a perfect state of mind. But you have to have a perfect state of mind. Jesus had a perfect state of mind. Total clarity. That's where this is leading us to. Right? The dark glasses the world presents can show but twisted images and broken parts. The real world pictures, pictures heaven's innocence. What if, we said, if, what if you saw no brokenness? Even in brokenness, there's no brokenness. Even in a broken body, for example. There's no brokenness. It's just the body that's broken. It's not the mind that's broken. Right? So you can have a body that uh, it's got all kinds of external difficulties, but the mind can be perfectly. Can, can, you can be sitting in a wheelchair and have some sort of disease, but it doesn't matter because you're still at peace. So you understand that you are healed when you give healing. You accept forgiveness as you accomplish it within yourself when you forgive. It's always reciprocal. It's always like this, right? As you give, so you receive. It's always a reciprocal process. That's what, it's so important that, you, that forgiveness be absolutely a part of everything because it's as you do that that you then are healed. Right? You're not forgiving anybody for doing anything. 
you're forgiving yourself for having seen the problem out there. Once you forgive yourself for having seen the problem, the problem is not there. <laughs> you get to be healed. You recognize your brother as, you, as yourself, and thus you perceive that you are whole. So anybody, if there's anyone, you look out there in the world, and you see anyone, and you say, that is not a brother or a sister. It's not, it's not, it's not a part of the whole, then there's a misperception. So Christ beholds no sin in anyone. And that's what God asks of us, that, we, that we, we see there is no sin. That's the solution. Tell a traditional Christian that, and they'll say, oh, there's plenty of sin. <laughs> Just look around. It's all over the place, right? But this is a bigger leap. If you're going all the way, there's no such thing. Uh, Jesus certainly didn't uh, say... He says in the Course with regard to Judas, for example, <laughs> uh, Judas was my brother, and as much a part of the sonship as you are or I am, right? And Judas didn't do anything except what Judas was supposed to do. <laughs> Sometimes that's what happens. Okay, so let's admit that we're all ego addicted. I think that, that's a very important part of beginning to understand the Course. We're, we're, we're ego addicted, and we're not even aware of the deep nature of our addiction. I mean, it is such a deep addiction that there's not even an attempt to try to break it. So, so the, the course is the first step in the course is really to realize how, how deeply, another word I sometimes use is insane, how insane or addicted we are, and that you want, you really want to break that. That's Bill saying to Helen, there's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. And if you don't go looking for that other way, then in terms of the course, you just, you stay asleep. You just sleep. You keep sleeping, but you're sleeping. You're not, it's not a contented sleep. It's just a, it's a sleep of, an, of avoidance. I mean, you're, you're avoiding responsibility, essentially, right? Which is not a happy place because, again, that's the existential angst. Again, that's the, that's the sense that something is wrong. But I don't know what it is and I don't know how to fix it. So I just live in this wrong world. I just live in this hellish kind of world all the time. That is not true. And you don't have to do that. You don't have to see that way. The ego is crafty and insidious. It likes to hide. There's a lot of ways to hide. Alcohol, drugs, sleep, overeating, just avoid projection itself is a form of hiding because projection says the problem is not in me, it's in you. The Course is asking that we look and see where it is in ourselves. Uh, fantasy is its favorite game. <laughs> it's interesting we get so much fantasy like on television and games and stuff like that, which is, could just be another way of, there's nothing wrong with fantasy, but it could be, it's just an escape vehicle. Another way we could say this is that we're all dreaming. Of course, it's very, we're all dreaming. The whole world is dreaming. Um, and only occasional do we have moments of lucidity <laughs> and awakeness and, and seeing the truth and, and knowing it and, and being able to sustain it. That's the trick, being able to sustain that awareness, that lucidity. Okay. So the world is an illusion, and those who choose to come to it are seeking to, for a place where they can be illusions and avoid their own reality. And so think about it. that applies to all of us. We're all, we're all here, right? I mean, we all <laughs> chose to come here. We're all in this world. And at some point, we must have chosen to have come into this world because nothing happens by accident in that sense. And it, it is our choice, right? Yet when they find their own reality is even here, it's because you can't escape it. You cannot run away from it. If you remember Zhao Wang, who was here last, I think it was October, the Chinese girl who was about to commit suicide, at the point of, of 
planning on killing herself, she realizes that uh, she's not going to be able to, that suicide will not help. That will not enable her to, to escape. Right? Because you still got the mind. You can't, <laughs> you can't run away from the mind. You can run away from the world. You can run away from a relationship. You can run away from a job. You could step out of some unpleasantness, which might even sometimes be a good idea. But you can't get away from the mind. So what other choice is there to make? To let illusions walk ahead of truth is madness. And we do that by letting the whole world walk ahead of us as an illusion. I mean, by, by buying into the illusion. Take politics, for example. By buying into the, the, that there's a problem out there in the world of politics. That has always been true, and it always will be true, because that's the nature of politics. <laughs> so it's like an ongoing, never-ending soap opera. That uh, you would, I don't know why people want to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, who wants to get caught in a power game? It, because that's what it is, it's power games that are going on. And you can't be happy and be caught in a power game at the same time. So, but to let illusion sink behind the truth and let the truth stand forth as what it is, is merely sanity. A good example of that would be to be in any situation you're with with somebody else and you begin to feel an antagonism or difficulty and you might want to say something about that. But rather than say something about that, let illusion sink behind the truth. Now when we say that, it's like let the love come out instead of the criticism. If you see, let's say you're in a relationship, right? Let's say you're talking to your mate, right? And you, you have a, a, something you could say that would straighten them out a little bit. <laughs> Never works. <laughs> and the reason it never works is because the other person's going to ego too, and they're going to take it as an attack. You know, so what you want to do is reverse that. Reverse that process. Go the other way. It literally, so then let love out. So you let some love out instead of the correction out. And let the person feel the love. Now what are they going to do? <laughs> They'll have to accept the love because the love is genuine. All right. So anybody ever read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe? Uh, I think we talked about this once before you did. Uh, Stavrov has. Uh... All right, so there's actually a line in there where... Uh, it's interesting, this came out in 1979, um, and of course it was published in 1976. So I don't know that, uh, who, how, who's to know if Doug Adams read the <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the, to the Galaxy. But there's a world, there, there's, there's all these worlds out there. This is the Hitchhiker's Guide, so the whole galaxy is out there. And there's a planet that you can go to where you can create all your fan. You let, let your fantasies fly free. Just you can create. This is like, have you seen this thing on television about the year million, on the uh, channel? It's about what it would be like in the one, a theoretical date way in the future, where you, you could just create your own fan. You could create whatever you want to because your mind can create it. It's like having your own uh, island somewhere, and you can just create whatever kind of world you want to on that on that island, right? You can make up anything to satisfy <laughs> But that's kind of what we've done here. You know, you don't have to go to another planet to do it. You know, we, we create our own illusory worlds right here. And then we say, you know, we recognize that that's, but what kind of world do you want to create? But there's actually this line that appears in uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where the the space uh, ship captain screams out, I would rather be right than happy. <laughs> Which, as you all know, is a direct line from A Course in Miracles. Except it's just, I would rather be, do you want to be right or happy? Okay. Uh, this is actually the first uh, principle from the Course, right? 
We have about 10 minutes or so. Well, well we go way longer than that. I can get into a few of the principles, right? We made it. <laughs> Let me stop for a second. I have been talking constantly and just see if anyone has any. <laughs> well, uh, if, if any of you have any observations or questions or anything you'd like to share, why, here's your moment in which you can do it. Yeah, well, somebody's got a, yeah, Fran? No, no it's, it's, it's anything, but, uh, pass it to 10, oh, stop off. You got it. This may sound very obtuse. It's okay. Um, but somehow it seems to be in the same direction okay. in terms of finding peace. Mm -hmm. But I heard this on uh, someone speaking this today, and he said, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Mm -hmm. Merrily, 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 life is just a dream. Yeah, sure. I heard that this morning, and I went... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean... It, That's it. Yeah. So do you, you realize how much the Course is trying to help us to awaken from that dream? Um, and, and what a struggle it is on but, all of but, our behalf but, but to But one do more that? thing is to also enjoy the dream. I mean, to know it's a dream. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you, like even have fun with it. Yeah, sure. You know, or especially have fun with it. Especially have fun with it. I mean, that's yeah. the whole ba basis of humor, you know. And yeah. Um, yeah. so, I mean, that's what I, the reprieve that I find in that is that, um, you know, the way, the way, the, way the, the course can be read is that they're being told what to do or what oh. not to do anymore. Yeah. Don't think this way anymore. Don't do this, mm -hmm. do that, you know. But to... Um, Accept it all, you know, that, yeah, I think this way, but, there, but I can choose another way and not have to, you know, I can not use right. some earlier concepts, but just know that I still possess them. That's right. And so, and that is, we're on a stream, you know, that just... Yep. That's there. time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that really struck me. Yeah. When I heard that this morning. Yeah. Well, it's helpful to see that and to, like you said, even to be able to just enjoy that fact rather than emphasize the fact, right? John? See uh, yes, Beverly. I, you mentioned that you might say something about synchronicity or coincidence. Oh, well, I just, I did because uh, when I got to the young part, um, Jung, as you know, was fascinated with synchronicity. And I once did a lecture on synchronicity at a conference, and I was really surprised to, to watch this recent series on Einstein, which I really highly recommend. It's so good. So Jung and Einstein were friends. I did not know that before <laughs> this time. Uh, no, and, and in Zurich, they, 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 got, they would have dinner together frequently uh, just to talk about synchronicity, right? Which, I mean, not just to talk about synchronicity, but that was a, a major theme that both of them were excited about talking about with these wonderful, meaningful coincidences where things just happen. I know you're very interested in synchronicity. You yeah. keep finding synchronicities. You, you tell me about the, these, these oh, when an overlap, overlaps, and overlap that you're just totally not not expecting, <clears throat> but the good part of it is that it, it's, it's meaningful. And the Course also says, you know, there's nothing that happens, nothing that happens in this world that doesn't have its meaning in it for you if you're not completely dreaming and you're willing to, to see it and, un, and try to understand something about what it is that it's teaching you. <clears throat> now, it may be difficult to, to understand that, but it's just a nice to know that there is a grand design. 
And not only is there a grand design, but sometimes you see how the grand design, <laughs> my wife and I, this is just one, a little synchronicity, right? <clears throat> but it's like, and I'm sure that some of you can tell me, we're in Seattle. We're standing online at a fish restaurant. We turn and look next to us, our neighbors <laughs> from New York are standing in line. We don't even cross paths <laughs> in New York. <laughs> but that's just one of those kind of those, those dramatic kind of situations where how could this possibly happen? Right, can somebody go to us another illustration that did you just, you know, there's these, these events that an idea keeps reappearing. You talk, that's something that happens to you. You keep seeing things. Well, it's the, the deja vu experiences, the, 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 the moments in which you realize that there's probably a lesson here. If, and, and actually, Kierkegaard said, Life can only be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. And sometimes, it should be true for all of us, <clears throat> that you look backward through your life and you recognize that, especially perhaps at the times that events occurred, that you really did not want that. To, you, would not have, <clears throat> you would not have wanted to have that experience. When I had cancer, my first response was, no, this is not in my script. But obviously it was because it happened, right? Or any other thing like that, a divorce or... A, and then you look back and you realize, well, that divorce, well, that was, that was perfect. That was exactly what was supposed to happen. You know, it could even be an accident. Did you see the movie Crash? I saw you remember the movie Crash? It was an Academy Award winning movie from, I don't know, several years ago, a decade maybe, not, maybe not that long. But there have people come crashing into each other and it looks like it's all an incredible accident, but it's not. It's not an accident. There's a, there's a in, in, in Crash, I think the, a guy winds up saving the life of someone that uh, he, yeah. pardon? I think it was a policeman who yeah. uh, was abusive to. That's right. Right. And then he winds up saving her life later, right? Right, so he's abusive to her at one point in the door, and then he winds up not knowing it's her that he's saving the life of. <laughs> right. So we just the course I think should actually help in that in the process that it should help you to understand even synchronistic events that you didn't think of as being synchronistic. You meet someone, for example, or your paths cross in very strange. Who was a friend in my my study group. On Wednesday night, this topic came up, and he talked about how he was walking across a bridge in Salzburg, and one of his best friends is walking toward him on this bridge. I mean, <laughs> that, that's the same kind of a thing, right? Yes, uh, Stavro? So what strikes me is that it isn't so much the occurrences that are synchronous, but, uh, but, but our observation and connection and importance we put on them right and that I think I'm constantly offered opportunity that I miss yeah and um, only because I wasn't tuned in right so and, it, exactly so yes. think about what happens if you get tuned in mm -hmm. right? you, you get tuned in and, and you're you're seeing this happen all the time or you're seeing it much more so I want to read you a passage from the course uh, Chapter 21 and section 2 and here we go. Deceive yourself no longer that you are helpless in the face of what is done to you. Acknowledge that you've been mistaken. All effects of your mistake will disappear. This is the part about being responsible, right? It is impossible the Son of God be merely driven by events outside of him. It's impossible that happenings to come to him were not his choice. His power of decision is a determiner of every situation in which he seems to find himself, by chance or accident. And in this really great line, no accident or chance is possible within the universe as God created it, outside of which is nothing 
suffer, you decided sin was your goal. Be happy, you give the power of decision to him who must decide for God for you. So it's just really a matter of decision. And let, let's say that you've got some sort of a guilt thing going on, that, that your mind is occupied with a guilt thought. Well, that can only be coming from ego, <laughs> right? So if, if you want to take it to a little higher level, you realize that this is nothing. You know, that God, this is a part of God's plan too, and it will take you out of this. It'll take you out of it as you assume responsibility for what you're thinking, right? Does that make sense? It, it's just, it's all a matter of change of mind. It's all a miracle is. And there's no reason why we can't all become much more miracle-minded. So there were always, even in those circumstances in which it's like, uh, well, you just don't want this to happen. <laughs> you know, and, and yet it's exactly what's supposed to happen. And it will change. Right? So let's, let's uh, we'll close with a meditation. <clears throat> so obviously we're at uh, principle number three, so that means we'll start with four. And I'll see if I can get through four into the 20s at the very least next time. And then in August, we'll go, we'll complete it. So we'll start with something fresh in September. <clears throat> so if you want to take uh, a couple of deep breaths and relax and close your eyes. <clears throat> and let's just, this one very simple idea be a part of your thinking right now. This is Lesson 74. There is no will but God's. This idea can be regarded as the central thought toward which all our exercises are directed. God is the only will. There is no will but God's. When you have recognized this, you have recognized that your will is his. The belief that conflict is possible has gone. As an expression of the will of God, you have no goal but his. There is no will but God's. There's great peace in this idea. The idea itself is wholly true. Therefore, it cannot give rise to illusions. Without illusions, conflict is impossible. Let us recognize this today and experience the peace this recognition brings. Repeat this idea several times. Slowly and with firm determination to understand what the words mean. There is no will but God's. Repeat this idea quietly to yourself. There is no will but God's. There is no will but God's. I cannot be in conflict. And now repeat the following phrase slowly to yourself after I say them. I am at peace. Nothing can disturb me. My will is God's. My will and God's are one. Conflicting thoughts are meaningless. There is no will but God's. I share it with him. My conflict about, now think of someone or some situation. My conflict about K 
cannot be real. Try to experience the peace to which your reality entitles you. Sink into this peace and feel it closing around you. There is no will but God's. Joy characterizes peace. There is no will but God's. Amen. Thank you. So I hope to see you in uh, July. And uh, take some mint. <laughs> Be demented. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.